Stanford University. Well, welcome back. Uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to be here. Given the concerns about global warming and energy security, many countries around the world are interested in either expanding the nuclear power or in acquiring it if they do not now have it. According to the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, some 30 states currently operate nuclear power reactors, many more have research reactors, and 40 states, even after Fukushima, have asked the IAEA in Vienna for assistance in starting new nuclear power reactors. At the same time that this so-called renaissance and in interest in nuclear power is occurring, we have North Korea acquiring nuclear weapons, Iran acquiring the materials for nuclear weapons and being accused by the United States and others of trying to secretly, covertly acquire a bomb. And we have the growth of terrorism and the threats that that poses in terms of nuclear terrorism. So the question I'm posing, can we have nuclear power without having nuclear weapons? And my clear answer, simple answer, is it depends. Depends on what countries acquire this capability. Depends critically on what international mechanisms we set up to constrain the weapons side of nuclear power while maintaining the civilian power side. So what I'm going to do first off is talk to you about what we know about who's trying to get nuclear power, what are their characteristics, who's tried to get nuclear weapons, what are their characteristics, and then talk about some of the policy questions, including these international mechanisms or international regimes or constraints that could be in place. The first slide I have here is a um, slide that I've made that shows who has nuclear power today, who has one or more nuclear power, civilian nuclear power reactors, and who, according to the IAEA in 2009, had come to them pre the Fukushima Daiichi accident to ask for assistance in putting together a nuclear power plan to get their first reactor. And besides the geographical spread, you'll see uh, this moving into the Middle East and Africa, into Latin America for the first time. I think the other thing you can do as a political scientist is try to assess what are the political characteristics of these new countries. So what I've done here is put together a chart that compares the existing nuclear states, nuclear power states in blue, to the aspiring nuclear power states in red. And show that in terms of World Bank indicators of corruption, the, this is control of corruption, the new states, aspiring states, are much worse. In terms of political stability, another World Bank indicator, aspiring states are much worse. Government effectiveness, regulatory quality, much worse. And in terms of democracy scores, using a, a common measure used in political science called the Polity 4 data set, aspiring states are, on average, much less democratic. And as you'll see in a moment, that's important. Where you get corruption and political instability, you have increased dangers of theft, of improper following of regulations. And where you have more autocracy and less democracy, you have a greater likelihood of not keeping your international commitments. And you'll see that in a minute, some evidence to support that notion that democracies have kept their bargain in their agreements under the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT, not to acquire nuclear weapons, while non-democratic states, a number of them have actually cheated. And so the democracy score matters. What I've done is update the previous chart from 2009 with current estimates of how the Fukushima Daiichi accident in March this year has influenced states. And what you see in terms of red lights, green lights, yellow lights, the vast majority of states are moving forward with their nuclear power acquisitions or expansion plans. A handful, Germany and Switzerland of the nuclear power states, Israel, Thailand, some of the Latin American states have uh, gone against their previous plans, and then the yellows are still uh, deciding. Japan, um, 
the previous prime minister actually advocated against getting nuclear power and expanding it and was talking about getting rid of it. And the current uh, prime minister has actually um, suggested that he might reverse that and continue on with their current plans. According to the director general of the IAEA, by IAEA estimates, the International Atomic Energy estimates that in their lowest prediction, uh, projection for the future, uh, they predict that they're going to be um, 90 new nuclear power plants in operation within the next 10 to 15 years. Their highest estimate is 350, which is almost doubling the current capacity of nuclear power plants in the world. So that's what we're thinking about nuclear power. What do we know about nuclear weapons, though? This chart outlines the growth in the number of countries that have nuclear weapons. From the United States in 1945, Russia, Great Britain, France, China, Israel, India, South Africa, secretly developing, never testing, but developing six nuclear weapons. Perhaps they tested. We're not 100% sure. Um, around 19, in the late 70s, Pakistan, Ukraine, Belarus, and Kazakhstan inheriting the weapons that were on their soil when the Soviet Union collapsed, and then getting rid of them during the Clinton administration, and North Korea uh, being the last state to test nuclear weapons. So we have nine nuclear weapons states today. This, however, this chart is less well known. Um, this is my estimate. Um, based on my own research and that of a number of, of other scholars, uh, of the states that have started exploring nuclear weapons programs, had a dedicated facility, had a signed budget, some of this public, much of it very, done very privately, and we're only discovering it many years later. And here you see Switzerland, Brazil, Sweden, Yugoslavia, Egypt, Australia, briefly Italy and West Germany, South Korea, Australia got rid of their program that started it up, Taiwan, Iran, Iran after the Shah stopped it and then started it up again, Algeria briefly, Romania, and Syria. So you have a number of countries, 16 states in total, who started nuclear weapons programs and then got rid of them. Why? Well, there's no one, in my view, there's no one overarching explanation. Some of these cases are cases where there was a regime change, the South Africans or the Romanians, and the new regime came in and got rid of the program. In other cases, it was a pressure from the United States to Taiwan saying, if you go forward with this, our relationship with you is over. To the South Koreans saying that our troops are going to come home immediately if you go forward with this program. In some cases, it was a military operation. The Iraqi program was killed off first in 1981 by the Israelis, and then later by the uh, coalition forces after the 1991 war. Not the 2003 war, but the 1991 uh, war. Um, and yet, for many of these countries, the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, was a very important element in either the decision to get rid of the program or the decision that they wouldn't restart it once they had slowed it down. And the NPT, Non-Proliferation Treaty, is a legal agreement ratified by virtually all states in the international systems. The only major exceptions are Israel, India, and Pakistan, where the non-nuclear weapon states have said that they will agree not to get nuclear weapons. In exchange, they can have free access, they can have access, legitimate access, not free, legitimate access to nuclear power, civilian nuclear power. The nuclear weapon states agree that they won't help their friends get nuclear weapons and that they will work in good faith towards the eventual elimination of nuclear weapons. What you have here is a different way of showing some of the same data. What I've taken is that data of all the countries that sought nuclear weapons at one point in time and have put in with black dots 
when they ratified the Non-Proliferation Treaty as non-nuclear weapon states, when they said that we agree that we won't work on to acquire nuclear weapons, then I have put a timeline of when they secretly had a nuclear weapons program and have colored it on whether they are an autocracy, semi-democracy, democracy, or during a transition period. And what you'll notice when you look at this data is that all the countries that ratified the treaty saying they won't get nuclear weapons and then have a colored line next to them on the going forward, that is all the countries who cheated on their agreement, did so when they were non-democracies. What we don't know is whether that was because they thought as a non-democracy they were less transparent and wouldn't get caught, or whether they thought as a non-democracy that their people wouldn't punish them for not keeping international agreements. It may differ from different states and further research is necessary to try to figure that out. But it is, I think, a strong observation that democracy makes a difference with respect in this area to treaty compliance. So what does this mean? Well, it first means that you need to pay attention to what countries are trying to acquire nuclear power, although whether they're democratic or not isn't one of the criteria that you can use very easily with respect to the NPT because the Non-Proliferation Treaty says you need to have free access to nuclear power, legitimate access to nuclear power regardless of whether what your political system is as long as you're a member of the, tr of the treaty. It does suggest we have to have very strong inspection schemes and pay special attention to non-democracies acquiring nuclear power. In addition, nuclear power just gives you the capability because there will be plutonium produced by a light water reactor, so you have materials that can be used for a bomb. As importantly is your technology to either make the fuel to enrich uranium, which goes into the reactor, light water reactor. And here are the number of countries that today have uranium enrichment capabilities. And here are the number of countries who have plutonium reprocessing, who take the plutonium out of a spent fuel rod coming out of a light water reactor and have practiced or currently have capabilities to reprocess it, to separate the plutonium, put it back into a reactor if necessary. That's the legitimate reason to do it. The other reason is to use it to make a to make a bomb. So what has the United States done to try to address these complicated set of problems? Can we have nuclear power without nuclear weapons? Well, first, after many years of um, not, uh, in many people's views, uh, of not being very consistent in our policies, President Obama, in his famous Prague speech in 2009, reiterated or recommitted the United States to work in good faith towards the eventual elimination of nuclear weapons. It was highly controversial. Time magazine ran an essay saying we should give the Nobel Prize, give nukes the Nobel Prize because they've saved the peace and President Obama is going to weaken the United States. But the president also said that as long as the other countries have nuclear weapons, we're going to have to keep them, but we're going to engage in good faith arms control to try to reduce the numbers, reduce the role of nuclear weapons in our own national sec security policy. And in the sense that the NPT says that you, all states have to work in good faith towards the eventual elimination, that's part of the bargain, and under the US Constitution, a treaty that's been ratified by the Senate is the supreme law of the land, all the President Obama was saying, in my view, is that the United States is going to keep our laws. Now, this was actually very important because it created a change in the U.S. nuclear weapons doctrine. Um, I used to work in the Pentagon on nuclear weapons targeting issues and arms control issues an arcane subject, one that the military still has to obviously pay a lot of attention to. If we have these weapons, if we're concerned about deterrence, what are we going to target them? How are we going to use them? And the Obama administration put together a posture review 
for the first time had every bit of it declassified. And you see a copy of it here, and two strong arguments. One was saying that to the degree that we think that we are seen by the non-nuclear weapon states as working in good faith, we can actually have a stronger policy of trying to inhibit or punish countries who are cheating. They think that we're not keeping our side of the bargain. How are we going to get others to put pressure on the Irans or the North Koreans who have not kept their side of the bargain? And then secondly, we changed our doctrine from what had earlier been a calculated ambiguity, that statement that we might use nuclear weapons, all options were on the table, as President Bush once said, against Iran, when asked in a press conference, you said all options are on the table, does that include nuclear weapons? And he said all options are on the table. Now that may have added a slight element of deterrence against Iran, it also gave them an extra incentive to try to get nuclear weapons, and it made a number of non-nuclear weapon states really angry, saying, how can we support you in your efforts to stop proliferation when you're brandishing nuclear weapons around? So the current policy has changed. It says that as long as the country is in compliance with its non-proliferation treaty agreements, we will not use nuclear weapons against them. Even if we go to war, we will not use nuclear weapons against them. Even if they use chemical or biological weapons, we will not use nuclear weapons against them. And this not only helped in the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference, where for the first time the treaty members, instead of siding with Iran that said the United States is threatening us, instead sided with the United States and said that we should actually make the additional protocol, make extra um, inspections a mandatory part of the future of nuclear power to make sure that other countries aren't cheating. <laughs> and it also helped us in a major change in the nuclear suppliers group. This is a, again, an international institution that consists of all the countries that sell nuclear uh, power technology, <coughs> the exporters of nuclear technology. Uh, with one exception, um, and that's Pakistan. Uh, all other countries that have exported nuclear technologies are members of this group. And their old policy <coughs> was respect to this trans the transfer of sensitive facilities. That means uranium enrichment and plutonium reprocessing. They said, well, <coughs> you should design so uranium doesn't go to a higher than 20% because once it's above 20%, it starts to be closer to bombs grade material, and that you should exercise restraint. That's all it said, exercise restraint. And then in June this year, the United States was able to push through an agreement that adds extra constraints. Countries that previously had not supported us, say they want to export for commercial purposes, agreed that all countries have to have an additional protocol, which is um, a special kind of inspection that the International Atomic Energy Agency can demand spot inspections of any place in your country, and you have to let them in there within 24 hours if there's something that's suspicious. To get this kind of technology, you have to have safeguards in perpetuity. The non-proliferation treaty, like most agreements, you can withdraw from it if you give 90 days notice. And this says that you have to agree that even if you do that, you have to have international atomic energy inspectors at those facilities to make sure that you're not taking any materials out of that. And lastly, you should avoid transferring designing and manufacturing technologies so that if a country did withdraw from the treaty, if they just have a so-called black box technology, they've got the, a centrifuge capability or reprocessing capability that's being inspected, but they've never built it, they've never learned how to do that, it's still being under inspected, it makes, it makes it much harder for them to acquire. So this is a set of constraints now that have been put on especially sensitive facilities. There's still two main challenges. Iran, seen here with Mahmoud Ahmadinejad walking through their 
centrifuge facility in Natanz, where they now have developed enough low enriched uranium that if they further enriched it to bomb grade materials could make a handful of nuclear weapons. Estimates range from the low numbers of three months to more moderate and more widely held views that would take a couple years for them to do that, to kick out the inspectors, to rejigger the centrifuges and put the low enriched uranium through again and again. It's my judgment that they are creating a nuclear weapons capability, and if you read the papers in the last few days, you'll see that the United States government has been asking the International Atomic Energy Agency to declassify their intelligence, their information that shows what uh, the Iranians are at least doing in terms of experimental work on weapons. And here you have a photograph um, taken just before sep September 2007 of a box of a building that the United States, through uh, Israeli intelligence, uh, spotted in the Syrian desert. Um, it looks like, uh, appeared to be everything uh, smelling like, looking like, being the same size of the graphite reactor that the North Koreans used to develop their nuclear weapons. North Koreans were eventually found uh, transferring technology, being on the spot, and this was the facility that Iran, I'm sorry, that Israel bombed in September 2007. The International Atomic Energy Agency asked, since Syria is a member of the treaty and can't work on nuclear weapons, they asked to look at the spot. When they got there, the entire place was bulldozed, but they found radioactive material in the rubble. They asked, can we look at some other facilities that we have suspicions about? And the Syrians said no. And that's what's caused the International Atomic Energy Board to vote to send Syria to the UN Security Council for suspected violations of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And unfortunately, the US effort to get a sanction placed on Syria, economic sanctions as we placed on Iran, was vetoed in the UN Security Council by Russia and by China. I don't think the Russians and the Chinese want the Syrians to get nuclear weapons, but they also want to keep their economic and political relations with the Syrians. And they also, ironically, thought that punishment wouldn't be very effective anymore, wouldn't be necessary in stopping their program because the Israelis have already stopped their program. So I talked first about nuclear power, then about nuclear weapons and the connection between the two. Let me briefly then discuss the other new challenge, and not entirely new, but, but more severe today, the challenge we face in terms of nuclear terrorism. Um, ever since Osama bin Laden issued a self-proclaimed uh, fatwa, uh, a Islamic decree, uh, saying that all Muslims should work to get nuclear weapons. People have been very concerned. Uh, we know that Al Qaeda hired two Pakistani scientists out of their nuclear program. Uh, we found primitive, not very effective, but primitive drawings of nuclear weapons in caves in Afghanistan uh, after the invasion in 2001. Um, and yet I want to note that even if Al-Qaeda is even more severely damaged than it is today, and it is severely damaged, that if you look at the history, other terrorist organizations have also been interested in nuclear weapons. Al-Qaeda is not the first, and it's unlikely to be the last. Why do I say that? Well, here's a picture of the Bader Meinhof gang, the left-wing German terrorist organization that in the 1970s uh, attacked a US base in West Germany trying to seize the nuclear weapons that we had on German soil. You have a picture of one of the members of the Red Brigades, the Italian left-wing terrorist organization that captured a US general, an Air Force general, held him captive, 
and quizzed him on the procedures for the guards and the locations of nuclear weapons in Italy. We have the Aum Shinrikyo head, Shoko Ashihara, the man who claimed to be a mixture of Buddha and Jesus Christ and told his cult followers in Japan that they should start a world war because only they, the true believers, would survive and the world would be renewed. Their efforts to acquire nuclear weapons, mostly through the Russian arsenal, because they had lots of members of their cult in Russia, failed. They turned to biological weapons, were unsuccessful in making a, a virulent form of anthrax. Instead, they turned to chemical weapons, sarin gas, which they used in the Tokyo subway uh, in the 1990s. And most recently, the Chechen rebels uh, had plans to seize a Russian submarine, actually did plant a small vial of nuclear materials in Moscow as a threat, and then just before they attacked um, in November 1995, the uh, Moscow uh, opera uh, and took over a, a, a theater and killed many people on board with a major act of terrorism. Prior to that, they had contemplated attacking a nuclear laboratory outside of Moscow in order to both create sabotage and potentially get uh, more nuclear uh, weapons. The 800 people who were killed in the <coughs> Ravka theater <coughs> in 2002 I think would have been much larger had they attacked this other facility uh, outside of Moscow. Moreover, not only are terrorists interested in trying to seize a weapon or get materials that could be used in a weapon, a nuclear weapon, they are also interested in using radiological devices, that is, getting materials that can't be used for a weapon but could spread plutonium or spread other hazardous nuclear materials by just strapping them around a regular conventional explosive and creating health hazards or environmental hazards. Not that they'd kill thousands of people, probably kill a smaller, much smaller number. But we have a number of known cases, again, showing the range of terrorists today who have been interested. James G. Cummings. Mr. Cummings was a millionaire living in Belfast, Maine, who was discovered <coughs> to have been shot and killed by his wife in February 2009. He was a neo-Nazi, was discovered to have many hate messages written for Barack Obama, was found to have in his garage um, uh, two jars of thorium, one gallon, uh, of a mixture that include lithium metal, aluminum powder, literature on dirty bomb, and a series of hate letters to Barack Obama. He was killed by his wife uh, after a series of sexual abuses, and she reported it to the police, and they found this materials. On the right, you have Sharif Mobley, arrested last March by counterterrorism officials uh, because of his involvement in Yemen and Al-Qaeda. He has been accused of shooting a guard in an attempted escape and is currently in prison in Yemen. What's interesting about Sharif Mobley was that as recently as 2008, he had passed back federal background checks and was working in nuclear power plants in the United States. And there was no sharing of information between the six different power plants who over five years had hired this guy as a maintenance worker. Now he's discovered to have joined Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. And the middle one I think is the most interesting and potentially dangerous radiological device or dispersion device. Um, a, a British citizen of Pakistani descent, Diran Borat, who um, was tasked by Al Qaeda in Pakistan to help them develop a radiological dirty bomb. Uh, the results of his uh, paper have been uh, submitted in a redacted form for the trial. And you hear, see here that uh, he's trying to figure out how he can do this. Goes through different radioactive isotopes. 
Um, thinks that there'd be 40 people who were affected in case studies in the past. So what he decides to do is try to get um, a particular kind of um, americium that you have in a number of medical devices and especially in one particular uh, form of a fire alarm to have someone in Al-Qaeda buy up a lot of it. You see here there's a contacts um, who might be able to purchase uh, that. So he's going to try to get 10,000 smoke detectors that have this little bit of americium in it, put it all together, explode it, have the fire occur in a popular place. It costs about 70,000 pounds. And this I found the most chilling was that his estimate was that there would be 500 long-term affected as 500 deaths from cancer exposure if dispersed in a busy area, inshallah, God willing. Fortunately, he was captured and now is in prison in, in Great Britain. Well, what can we do about this? This is a different kind of threat. This can't be dealt with by international atomic energy inspectors very easily. It certainly can't be dealt with by deterrence, our traditional method of trying to deter other countries. And yet there are a couple things. One is that in 2010, the US administration invited the political authorities, the leaders of 47 different nations to Washington and held a major nuclear summit saying, this is a new problem that we have to work together on. And I thought it was actually quite brilliant because they said, we're, all, we're going to try to lock up the most, most vulnerable especially anything that's highly enriched uranium that could be particularly dangerous or, or already separated plutonium. And as um, often happens, um, a one-shot negotiation is not very useful, not sufficient. So instead they said, we're going to get together every two years and we're going to pass around the responsibilities for holding the meetings. The next one's going to be uh, in March 2012 in South Korea and that every prime minister or president invited to this does not want to come back two years later and have to report to his or her fellow heads of state that we didn't do anything about it. So the bureaucracies in their countries are busy trying to come up with metrics and things that they can tell their leader, here's something that you can do to show others that we've locked up more materials or have been better at it. In addition, there are other international institutions. The IAEA, that group in Vienna, won the Nobel Peace Prize and is responsible for safeguards, that is, for the inspectors to make sure countries aren't cheating, have also put together a voluntary security mission that any country that wants help in getting its physical security, its protection for its power reactors or its nuclear fuel production or any nuclear capabilities, can now invite the IAEA to have specialists go in there and help. There's been lots of bilateral assistance. Um, the United States, as a new form of arms control, has many bilateral agreements with countries to go to their country and inspect or advise. Indeed, all three of the major U.S. nuclear weapons laboratories, Los Alamos, Livermore, and Sandia, have programs active in many countries, a new kind of arms control, if you will, to help protect the nuclear materials and especially to help new countries trying to acquire nuclear power to do it right. And lastly, the World Institute for Nuclear Security was formed two years ago. Um, I was just at uh, they're meeting, giving a, a, a talk in South Africa last week where they get together with other nuclear power operators, the actual security forces, the head of security, the CEO of the company, and they get them together in private meetings and discuss what are the best practices. No one likes to air their dirty linen in public, if we have a private meeting, maybe you can tell us about some problem that you had, some solution that you've discovered. 
What are the best ways of having personnel reliability programs, psychological tests? What kinds of exercises do you do? How do you ensure and maximize security? A very useful innovation, one that I'm very proud uh, to be involved with. But ultimately, I think for the new nuclear power states, the biggest challenge is that many of them don't take the threat of terrorism seriously enough. Indeed, one of the unspoken or rarely spoken assumptions among many of the new states is that, yeah, it's not going to happen here. And if somebody steals nuclear materials, they'll probably use it against you guys. Because America, whose foreign policy is abhorrent to many of the jihadi terrorists, and I like to remind them that even if you think that might be the case, A, it may not be true. Terrorists may be interested in sabotaging or using materials in your country. And B, any terrorist attack against the United States or against Western Europe has economic repercussions throughout the world. And that we need to have a change of our way of thinking about this. A terrorist incident in the United States or in Western Europe has economic consequences around the world and that a terrorist problem in one place is a problem for us all. So I'll include with this slide and take questions and comments. And I just put this last slide up to say that this is an ongoing problem and one that I think our foreign policy is important. We have President Obama pledging that we're going to work in good faith to eventually get rid of nuclear weapons and take immediate steps like the agreement with the Russians to cut the numbers of weapons, the agreement in our doctrine to change who we're going to target weapons against. You have the promise of peaceful nuclear power in the middle, but you also have on the right-hand side a repeat of the slide that I started with, which was the nuclear research reactor in Bombay, India, that the Indians secretly used to get the plutonium to develop their first bomb. These are the twin sides that nuclear power and nuclear weapons are intricately linked together. And what we can try to do through the international mechanisms is try and both to reduce our reliance on nuclear weapons and to try to encourage others to accept restrictions in their nuclear power operations in ways that reduce, even though it may not eliminate the threat of nuclear weapons in more hands or in the hands of terrorists. I'll conclude just by noting that whether you're personally in favor of nuclear power, especially after Fukushima, is an important choice, an important thing for you to think about. But ultimately, it doesn't matter that much whether you're in favor of nuclear power. It doesn't matter very much whether I'm in favor of nuclear power. What matters is that there are some 30 countries who don't have it today who are trying hard to get it. And therefore, it seems to me that we need to all work together for those countries that are exercising their sovereign right to acquire nuclear power, to do so in ways that their facilities, their reactors, and their fuel used are successfully safeguarded to make sure that there's no cheating, successfully secured so that there's no theft or seizure by terrorists, and maintained in as safe a manner as possible. I'll conclude there, and I'm very much looking forward to your questions and your comments. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.